Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really, really chuffed to be at Connector and at Atopia. It's such a fantastic space. Um, hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Shana Jackson, and I've been working um, on digital media with kids for a decade, well, almost two decades. I'm trying to pretend I'm still young, I suppose. But in July 2018, I became the artistic director of Sight Gallery um, in Sheffield in England. And we have a remit of new media, moving image and performance. Um, so digital is inherent to the work that we show. Uh, we're a contemporary gallery. We don't have a collection. Um, we reopened in September 2018, after 18 months, we were closed for expansion. And we have an established program for young people. Um, young people uh, are 14 to 19 at Site Gallery, and the group is called the Society of Explorers. Um, but of course, with my background, I'm really keen to extend activity in the gallery to children um, and their families. But before Site Gallery, before all of that, for years I had this um, multi-hyphenate role of strategist, director, producer, curator, writer, ooh. Um, so I was working across um, all digital experiences and products, across publishing, uh, new media, um, and the arts. So I've had lots of roles. Um, but the, there's one question that I always ask myself when I'm creating a project, and that is how can I make art artists um, and culture accessible, relevant, meaningful for young children through digital experiences. And then it's really important to unpick that question further. I always have to think about what I mean um, when I say young people. What does that mean? What's the definition? Um, are they babies? Are they preschoolers? Are they teenagers? Are they school leavers? You know, can they read? Um, do their families have access to technology, the technology um, and platforms that I'm trying to, <coughs> excuse me, create work for? Um, do I, you know, do these people even want this content that I'm making, or am I actually just making it for me and my institution because that's what I should be doing? Um, so I've worked uh, for and against a lot of places internationally. Um, I worked at the Tate Gallery for years. I launched a platform called Take Kids in 2008, which at the time was seen as um, a bit of a blueprint for the way children um, could be engaged with in the cultural sector. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's funny how times change because you look back on it or you, you have to look back on it through the Wayback Machine because it's changed so much. You know, it's a collection of flash games and flash games, you know, are dead. Um, so it's, it's, it's funny how things change. Um, I wrote and produced um, and directed an audio guide for The Broad, uh, which are in LA. Um, I create, curated events for the Design Museum. I'm on the board of BAFTA, which is a, a film charity in the UK. And I worked with the Royal Collection Trust to try and meet Prince Harry, but it didn't work. And outside of arts and culture, um, I also do work with, with commercial and corporate clients because it's really important to make those connections between culture and commerce and also to make enough money to feed my child and my dog. Um, so I was the first creative director at a company called Hopster, which it is like a, a Netflix for kids with games, um, and Azumi, which is the same thing for, for slightly older. So what kind of work do I do for these companies, these organizations? Well, I create programs, uh, with the, a program called, uh, an example of one program is Squad 34. Um, and that group created all these gifts and these presentations. So what I was doing in, in that was encouraging young people um, in a disadvantaged town in the UK to be really creative through the technology that they owned. So every kid carries a mobile phone. So let's use that. Why are we you know, whipping out the map books? We don't need to do that. So we uh, used our phones to run workshops, creating GIFs, um, giving them some context behind selfies and adding, um, giving them some photographic techniques to improve their selfies. And, you know, they've made all these GIFs. And it doesn't have to be uh, expensive and onerous work. It can be light touch, but still really engaging and have a real big impact on the children you're reaching. So I also curate uh, a show annually called Playground, and it focuses on work that 
that blends digital and physical um, experience and objects together for children and young people. This was the first year it ran, and then we're now on to the fourth edition. And it's part of the Children's Media Conference, which is based in Sheffield. So this, is, this will be coming to Site Gallery um, in the summer. Um, I also write books. So these were published by Tate in 2014. Um, art activity books, and I have a debut novel coming out on April 4th. But, but I tell you all this because people say to me, why? Why, why, do you, why, do you, why do you care about kids and why do you want to work with them? Who, you know, just give them anything, doesn't matter. Um, but that's not true. And I think I've been thinking a lot about why I work across all these roles and in this way. And there is like a through line between all of my work, which is this drive to encourage new and diverse and disengaged people with, with art and culture across the world. We all in this room know why art is good for you and we need to ensure that we are telling the next generation why. So that's what I do. So that's the official answer. But the real answer is because of David Bowie. Um, and the reason why I, I always I like to include this gift of David Bowie is because the media and the culture that I watched as a child really informed the way I think and the way I work today. So this film, this is from a film called Labyrinth. I'm sure some of you know Labyrinth. Labyrinth is like iconic. Um, and the truth is that I've bonded and made friends with people across social media because of Labyrinth. And for me, if, imagine if the content that you're making uh, could make such meaningful connections with a child that they take it on, you know, 38 years later, then, you know, you've done something really memorable. So um, sometimes I say I, I'm in the business of making memories, which is pretty cheesy, but it's true. So now I'm at Site Gallery, I'm thinking a lot about how I can weave this practice into the gallery and how can I, I can apply this learning to this new institution and um, I've been in post since September 2018 and there was um, there's been a lot of press about it and um, this was from uh, Freeze magazine I won't read it but basically they were saying well they quoted me as saying that I believe that participation is just as important as the artistic program. And to me, that's absolutely true. So now I'm figuring out ways of bringing the Society of Explorers, our young people, at the same level of our, as our artistic program and trying to interrogate what that means for the institution. So in, on one level, it means the participation team being at the meetings with the artists from the outset. And it's not just a you know an add-on after a afterthought. Um, so it's this real um, integration of the two sides of our business. And also in small practical terms, this seems like a really small thing and it is a small thing, but it's important. So before I came, the, the, um, the idea was to have limited edition prints behind the, recep re behind the reception. But as a gallery that does new media, moving image and performance, we have a real opportunity to, ex to show our audience what our brand is and who we're about. So we installed these screens, and these screens now have the work that the young people do every week. So as soon as you come through the doors, you can see work of young people. And it really, it's small, but it's a, it's a bit of a statement. It's saying that they are at the heart of what we do. Anyway, back to today, I'm, I'm wondering. I wanted to talk about five things that I've learned over, over the last 15 or so years working with kids. Um, basically, so you don't make the same mistakes that I have made. Um, and I want to give you the top five. So the first one, the first one is know your people. And by knowing your people, it goes back to what uh, Sonia was saying uh, this morning in the, in the panel discussion. You really, really need to know who your audience is. And you need to figure out who they are, but while recognising that they're not uh, just a homogenous mass of people. Uh, how old are these children you're speaking to? What are they watching? Do they still play Fortnite? Is Fortnite over now? Does, you know, is Minecraft a thing still? Uh, do they want to try VR? Do they even care about VR? Probably not. Do they, you know, do they care? Do they like Drake? Do they listen to Ariana Grande? Do they, you know, what are they, what are they about? Um, and 
while that seems like trite knowledge, it's really interesting and important to know what's, what they're thinking and what's happening so you can extrapolate some of that learning for some of the content that you might want to make. It's, it also um, leads into some partnership deals you might be making. Uh, if you want to cross-promote your content, it's, at Tate, we used to fall into this trap of you know, building something and then just thinking, oh, well, it's at the Tate Gallery. All the, you know, all the kids are going to care and want to come to it. That's just not the case. You still have to put your stuff out, no matter who you are and where you've come from. You know, you know, the internet's a wild west, and I'd be like lassoing children across it and trying to get them to come to my work, and it, it's a lot. But and again, another trite, seemingly obvious thing to say is to talk to children and find out what they want. But, you know, you don't always have to listen to them because sometimes they don't know what they want. But you have to have that conversation because it absolutely informs what you're doing. Um, and when you're working on a, on a project for a children, you have to, once you've defined them, you need to keep them in mind at all time and you have to be their representative in the project because, you know, as you know, when you work in a cultural institution, these projects have a million and one stakeholders and your initial concept uh, your final project can be very different from the initial concept and you have to be okay with that. But as long as you've kept the young people and the children in your mind at all times, then the product should be good. And another thing, um, you know, when I was designing Take Kids, we said it was for, you know, for 5 to 12 year olds. And 5 to 12 year olds is a huge, uh, massive, massive age group to aim at. So you really have to try and narrow it down and like find a sweet spot. So while I said Take Kids was 5 to 12, I'd say it was perfectly pitched for a nine-year-old. So I would be thinking of a nine-year-old um, when I was designing things. And similarly, when I was the creative director at Hopster, uh, that TV and learning app, the advertised age group was 3 to 6. Um, but really, it was aimed at a solid four-year-old because by the time kids reached five back in 2013, they all wanted to watch Minecraft videos, animal fails, whatever animal fails are, and unboxing videos on YouTube. They were far too old for what we were designing and selling. And when you're designing for kids, you always need to design up so the look and feel of your activity or your work should feel about two years older than the age of the intended audience. Kids don't like anything that smells babyish or feels that it might be for a child younger than them. They will just reject it. So you need to age it up and make them feel like they're cool and they've been let into this secret cool thing that you're doing. Um, when you're designing for kids, more often than not, you are designing for a dual audience. You need to, you know, because you have to reach that audience through the gatekeepers. So community leaders, parents, teachers, other adults, find out who they are and make sure that you're addressing them properly through the work that you're doing. That's knowing your people. The second thing to do is to know your you know yourself, know your brand. Know, when I say brand, make sure you understand the remit of your institution and where you're coming from, what your institu institutional values are and what that means for your output. So your positioning will really guide what content it makes sense for you to be creating. And once, if you're really clear on your own remit, I find that it was easier to get that sign off that you needed internally to make that idea ready. For, for me, working at Tate, you always had to have an argument for why you were going to do something and you needed to have that prepared. So prepare yourself to fight for your content. So I'll use Tate Kids as an example here. Um, I started that website in 20... 20, 2007, um, and I ran it alongside related activities for about six years, um, and it was um, basically, at its essence, a website to encourage young people to look at Tate's collection, look at our exhibitions, and get engaged with what it is that we did. And in 20, 20, in 2008, in the May, we had a street art exhibition where commissioned artists from across the world used the side of Tate Modern um, as their canvas. And I had just launched Tate Kids at this time with a, with a game called Tate Paint. And there was um, some fine, uh, end of year financial money floating about. So I don't know if you have this here as well, but at, sometimes at the end of the year, you're at a race to spend money. And I was like, always ready to grab pots. Uh, so I took that money 
And I reskinned that game and turned it into street art, which is a tool where kids could do the same thing as those artists, but digitally and paint on the side of the Tate Modern. So this, back, I mean, I took this, I took my job so seriously. So this background here is the actual bricks of Tate Modern. Um, and then the soundtrack was provided by staff who were in bands at Tate. So just trying to make everybody in this institution feel like they had a piece of what I was doing. And the more buy-in you get, the easier it is to do your job. So some of the works that we used to get through this device were really good. Um, and I knew, I know it got picked up by some street art blogs because we would find out and I think, you know, adults were on it, but I don't mind, that was fine. Um, so it was really interesting to see the way kids were using this tool. People would use it to leave like tributes and notes for each other, um, record what was happening with current affairs. It was really odd to see, not odd, but it was interesting to see how tools, providing tools for somebody and what would happen. Um, everything had to be moderated, obviously, before um, it went live. Um, I'll get into that a bit more later. But similarly, um, I created a tour for The Broad, uh, which is a, a gallery in LA. And LeVar Burton, if you aren't aware of him, is a popular ce celebrity in North America. And he did a show called Reading Rainbow, and he was on Star Trek. He was in uh, the one with uh, Jean-Luc Picard. Um, so he was uh, connected to the museum, and he was the, really the right person to narrate this tour um, and build it around him and his personality. And again, this is talking about the Broad in LA. You know, I understand that they're very privileged and have access to celebrities, but that doesn't mean that that learning isn't applicable and there are ways that this can be localised. Anyway, my third learning is to really understand what you want when you're making something and understand what it is that you're asking for. So... When I'm, when I'm making things, if, whether I'm a freelance or I'm in-house, some of the things I've heard are, we want a game, I need you to make us a game. And I would say, why? They say, because kids love games. But that's not enough of a reason to do something. Or people would say, oh, can we make a game like uh, Call of Duty, but make it arty? And I would say, well, what's your budget? And they said, oh, well, we've got about, you know, five euros and some complimentary tickets and it's like no that, that no we can't do that or we, one example we had was well Tate we were really obsessed at the time with like let's have our own video platform that's like YouTube and it's our channel and so why are you doing that oh because we can keep all our content in one place why would you want to keep all your content in one place where no one goes to why wouldn't you just put it on YouTube where people are it doesn't make any sense it's so crazy so like, understand what it is you're trying to communicate and understand who you are communicating it to and why you are communicating it to them and take it from there. So maybe you are curating a game and creating a game, or maybe you're not. Maybe you're actually, what you need is a set of tweets. Or, you know, maybe you just need, you know, some small videos on YouTube. Don't just think you need to make the new thing because it's cool. Think about the audience and what they want. So I'm thinking a lot about uh, young people, as I do, and I'm thinking about WhatsApp and making games f through WhatsApp because kids aren't really downloading apps in the way that we think they are anymore. Like go to where they are with something interesting for them. So, um, yeah, I loved making games. They were fun, they were beautiful, but they were really expensive and they needed a lot of marketing support, which our marketing teams really weren't that into. Um, so, you had to, it was really important for me to tie the activity I was doing with kids and young people to our exhibitions and then hopefully it would get, you know, pushed along in the big PR push of. I don't know, the Damien Hirst show that we had in 2012. It was, you know, being strategic about what we made. Anyway, and that leads me uh, nicely, well, it doesn't really need me nicely, but it leads me to making friends with benefits. <clears throat> and it's really important to make friends and increase your networks. Whether you're a huge museum like a Tate or a tiny gallery with three staff members, Getting kids to come to your content is really, really, really hard. So where possible, <clears throat> take your content to them and um, 
try and forge relationships with external partners. Um, you know, we have the, the cultural kudos um, and they have the audiences and often money. So get it together. Uh, so an example, again, another example from Tay, I did a brand takeover. It's so funny, these, these images were really sharp 10 years ago and now they're like, it's just pixelated and dying and fading. Um, but we had a takeover uh, with the Isle of Wight Festival. Tate Online was sponsored by a, a telecoms company, BT. And we had um, a Woodland, the Woodland Trust was sponsoring a festival. So it was getting lots of brands into the same room and offering something. So we ran a competition. We, took, we sent a family to the festival and the Woodland Trust paid for it. And it was great. Um, I made an interactive film called The Secret Dancer, where Degas' little dancer comes to life and dances... Um, around what was then the tanks at Tate Modern. So it was like a love letter to the undeveloped Tate. And I mean, I got everybody involved in this. Um, Royal Ballet School, a website called Miniclip. Miniclip, I don't know if, if you know Miniclip, but it, years ago it was a really great games platform. They got involved, the BBC, and partnerships like this didn't cost me money. While I absolutely understand the privilege of calling someone and saying that you're from Tate, um, brings you, it was still worth doing the work to ask because you never know what people are looking for. Um, so it was, really, it was really cute. These girls won the prize. And again, they, they won a DS, which was cutting edge at the time. And these girls are probably t like 25 now with their own kids. And they're, bless them, they're so cute. Um, and then the school took part and made this thing for me. And it was like the best day of my life. Um, but it was getting like making partnerships with schools and, and other people and getting them to spread the word, I guess, of what you're doing. And this was another project um, where we had a show at Tate Liverpool about uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Um, so I ran with that and went to a science-based funder in the UK called the Wellcome Trust and used Alice in Wonderland to um, teach young, ki young kids about how their brain works. So this was a series of games and interactive films that we um, managed to get a decent amount of funding for. We got like £200,000 to make this um, back then, so it was really, really special. Um, but I would say another note of advice on this point particularly is when you are in-house at a museum um, or a gallery working with external agencies, it's really important that that relationship feels like an, ap an actual partnership. So they don't work for you, or I mean, I know they do work for you, but you're working together. You know, so I've often found that the, in the cultural sector, being a client sometimes goes to the head of some people in the department. And we have to remember that our strength lies in knowing our collections, our brand and our assets, and their strength is in making these games. So let them do it. And let them do it well. Give them some breathing room. Don't be too tight with the briefs. But anyway, uh, these are all external relationships I'm talking about. Internal collaboration can be really, really, really hard in the gallery. And um, working at Tate, um, I feel like I'm just exposing Tate's secrets. Hi, come to me for Tate's secrets. But um, working internally at Tate was described as trying to turn a whale um, with a myriad of uh, different departments with different agendas and different approaches. And it was, you know, it was a really hard thing to do. So my point is make friends and be friendly and get things done because it's not about you, it's about enriching children. Um, and my last note is about creating communities or basically warn you off doing them. Um, so communities are a lot of work, a lot of work. So sometimes nobody comes to the community that you've created and you have, a lot, you have to spend a lot of time bringing children to that community or you get the opposite. So uh, at Tate, most of the games and interactivities that were made resulted in some user-generated content and all of that content had to be checked before it went live. Um, and to keep the website fresh and to ensure that kids would come back every day, you would have to moderate it more than once a day. Um, and Take Kids was me. It was just me. Um, and once at Christmas, um, I didn't feel like doing it. So I got slack and I didn't check it. And then I came back and I had 18,000 little bits of work 
to check. Um, so over Christmas, I just got some whiskey and I did it. But it was a lot. So you need to be really mindful of the things, of what you're making and what happens. And it was great. It was great to have that kind of engagement. But it's also unsustainable for one person to manage. So just be really careful of what you're doing. So those are my five things. I'm just going to recap them for you really quickly. Make sure you know your people. Understand who your audience is as deeply as you can. Ask them trite questions because sometimes that really unlocks something really useful that you can use to your advantage. Know yourself. Make sure you really fully understand your remit and that others in your organisation do so you, it enables you to increase your buy into your idea. Know what you want. Don't just make cool digital things because they're cool. That's a mistake. <laughs> Think about the audience. Make friends with benefits. Partner up and talk to people in your institution and break down the walls and brotherhood. Don't create communities unless you really have to. Thank you.